friend and welcome to Broadcast Original Series 1.12 with Amory and Peter. Hello. Hello. We's doing Galileo. 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 Seven. Yes, indeed. Um, <laughs> thank you. Written by Oliver Crawford and Espar David. The former was blacklisted in the 1950s oh. for not revealing names of fellow suspected communist writers. I like him already. Uh, yeah. Uh, first of three original series stories by him. Bar David had already written Dagger of the Mind. But this is based on the 1939 film Five Came Back. Spoilers. Um, <laughs> <laughs> although you don't know which five, because there are more than five to begin with. Uh, IMDB says, a plane has engine trouble while flying over a jungle inhabited by cannibals. Uh, that'll go well then. The film co-starred Lucille Ball, who, of course, would go on to found Desilu Studios. Uh Uh-huh. It's all a wheel within a wheel. Uh It's directed by Robert Gist. Gist? Not sure. Probably Gist, actually. Gist, because that's how you spell the gist of it, isn't it? Exactly, yes. Impresses straight away with a brilliant opening shot from the roof of the bridge. I love that. And there's some wonderful camera movements, particularly all the bridge shots, which could be quite static and boring. Yeah. But he does some really cool stuff with the camera, so... Top points to Mr. Gist, Stroke yes. Gist. He's got the gist of it. it yes. Ho, ho, ho. Aren't Betty I got clever. very bored of that joke in the course probably, of his lifetime. <laughs> yes, probably as bored as you get as people making jokes about your name, given your profession. Well, well I get it quite a lot. Yes. I then say what you do, and then they laugh even harder. Mm. Nominative determinism. He's bollocks, but there you are. Yes, because my maiden name's Slater and I was never going up a fucking roof. And there's nothing musical about me. So let's carry on. Oh, OK. You have lungs, though. I do. That's about the most musical thing about me, yes. No, as in lungs are an organ, aren't they? <sighs> yes, I... Let's not dwell on this and move on, please. OK. <laughs> Captain's log, star date 2821.7. Seven of our shipmates still have not been heard from. Our normal searching systems, useless. Do you know what you've done? You've concerned yourself with only seven people. You said something about a needle in a haystack. It's useless. If they're not there, Commissioner, and they're dead by now. So we'll use virtually every piece of equipment aboard this craft in attaining orbit. You mean three of us must stay behind? Yes. And who's to choose? As commanding officer, the choice will be mine. Prepare to abandon search. Set course for Marcus 3. Go back! It's getting hot. So it starts with a captain's log. They've got a cargo of important medical supplies. And there's a commissioner with a cravat. I mean, he must be a cunt if he's got a cravat, surely. Galactic eye commissioner. And a cape as well. Oh, yes, it's ridiculous. It's it's just the most fantastically ridiculous costume. It's silver and glittery and blue. We will never see this particular uniform again. I am not surprised. I am not sorry. But he is our proto-badmiral, our first one. Yeah. Although, yes, as you say, a Galactic High Commissioner. They'll later be referred to as Federation Commissioners, but, you know, that title hasn't <sighs> been invented yet. And he's overseeing and saying, you know, you have hardly got any time to do anything. He's played by uh, John Crawford, who is both in the Poseidon Adventure and Towering Inferno. So oh, I've seen both of them. Specialist in disaster movies. Uh, four different characters in Mission Impossible. Mm. And reportedly had a tough time with Shatner on set. Well, who didn't? Well, and probably because somebody's ego had been bruised and not being sent to stage for an episode, eh? Yeah, probably. I mean, probably they weren't acting, you know, the antipathy between the two of them. It was mm. probably just there anyway. <laughs> but he does look a twat <laughs> in that. It's the cravat, I think. It's yeah, just, that just, yeah. I mean, the, the little cape is silly, but when you pair it with a cravat, it's just... It polishes off the turd, doesn't it? Yes. It, it does. It mm. does, really. Yes. Anyway, the route that they're taking to... Planet Marcus, is that right? Yeah, I think so, yeah. To deliver these important medical supplies takes them past a quasar. Murasaki 312, named after a Japanese plant. And okay. also the purple dye that comes from it. Yeah, uh, purple. This effect is completely redesigned in the remasters version. Is it? To look like an actual quasar, which I suppose is acceptable. And generally the story's had an awful lot of work done on the remastered one. Mm. Replacing all the model shots with CGI and... 
uh, my usual complaint, it jumps out at you because the rest of it is like polystyrene boulders and yeah. naff spear props. And it's like, then you start putting 2000s effects in. Nah, it doesn't work. I'm sorry. No, no. So, I mean, the, the commissioner's just got cunt written all over him, hasn't he? Yeah, really? rather, yes. Yes. So then you have them launching a shuttlecraft. And I have to ask you, is this the first time? Is that where they make such a big deal of yep. let's launch the shuttlecraft? Oh, yes. Yes, very fun the birds, isn't it? Actually, it made me think more of the motion picture and the whole, oh, let's spend ages looking at this because it's oh, new and shiny and we love it and it's a spaceship and I'm going to orgasm now. They don't take that long on it, to be honest. <sighs> Far too long for me. It's a quickie, this one. Um... <laughs> no, it isn't. Trust me. <laughs> the miniature shuttle way is nicely realised, though. I love that. And it is, it's a shame they never used it again. They just reused the footage. But I guess that was common enough in Thunderbirds as well. So what are you going to do? Yeah. And the shuttlecraft's a nice design. Uh, originally, the design they came up with, they would have struggled to have realised it, which ironically is what then happens in Next Generation as well. But uh, uh, it was very 60s, the original design, whereas one's, this one's a bit boxier, more practical, because they have to have not just the model, but the uh, full-size prop as well. Yeah. So there's quite a lot of people on board on this shuttlecraft. So it's Funny enough, seven of them. Um... <laughs> yeah, no, bear with me. <laughs> The reason I say that is because shuttlecrafts in later Trek tend to see often only two people or four uh, at the most. Depends on the shuttlecraft, but yes, you're right. In some ways, this, in terms of the number of people that's carrying this, is more of a shuttle bus runabout. Yes, um, actually, interestingly, but there we go. They do squeeze them in in those days. We've got Yeoman Mears, who is played by Phyllis Douglas. She'll be back as a different character in season three, and she's in a couple of episodes of '60s Batman. This was originally going to be Rand. But they'd sat Grace Lee Whitney by now. A boo. Lieutenant Boma. Except Quinn thought it was Boner. Yes, our science dude, played by Don Marshall. It was hoped he'd become a regular in this series, but he signed up for two years on Land of the Giants instead. Later received recognition for his work on acting and race relations. Mm. We saw him recently in Planet of the Slave Girls as Jack Palance's right-hand man. Oh. Yes. Then we have Lieutenant Latimer, who's kind of the pilot dude who gets a spear in the back. Mm -hmm. uh, Lieutenant Gaetano, it's a reasonably meaty role. Plus you've got Spock, Scotty and McCoy, which makes seven. Yeah, and it's nice to see them. Again, because it's been a few episodes. It has. Nice to see Scotty and indeed Sulu back on the Enterprise yeah. as well. It's, yeah. Yes, it's a bit of a relief, to be honest. We thought they'd forgotten them. So as they're flying to investigate the quasar, the indicator is going crazy, and then you have a, a shot of them wobbling the model. Yeah, that's not so good, I grant you. <laughs> and it's, uh, it's obviously going to crash on a planet, actually, rather than just into the quasar. Yes, there's a planet in the quasar. And um, But all the Enterprise just has is they've picked up transmission, something about off course, and they've got no trace. They can't see it. They've got no clue. And that's your teaser. Yeah, so how are they going to find a 24-foot shuttlecraft? 24 foot? Doesn't Star Trek normally do metric? Oh, well, never mind. They obviously haven't, haven't got around to that yet either. And then when you come back, you pointed out just how many women there are on the bridge in this yeah. shot. One of them is giving everybody coffee, but the others are doing stuff. Yeah, this opening shot, as I say, is, is really good. And, and it's unusual to see that many women on the bridge, to be honest. There's normally one or a push two. Uh, but we've got at least three at this point, which is good. But yes, unfortunately, then you don't see them all on the bridge again together for the rest of the story. But never mind. So then it turns out that the planet that they're on, that they crash on is dead centre of the, the quasar, Taurus 2. And you have Spock in command as the sort of senior officer. And they discover that the atmosphere is breathable. Not ideal. McCoy says, you know, you're all right as long as you don't have to try and run hard. But, you know, it is breathable. So um, Spock's like, right, you two go out. Let's, let's investigate. We need to give Scotty some space to do his work on the shuttle. Um, but make sure you're armed. And then they press a button and a glove compartment opens and phasers come out. Yes, phaser glove box. That's excellent. 
<laughs> and Spock uh, turns Columbo at this point and says, just the facts, which I rather like. Yeah. <laughs> and then you have a conversation between Spock and McCoy where McCoy's like, oh, you know, you must be enjoying this, your first command. And Spock basically says he neither enjoys it nor fears it. It simply exists and he will do whatever is log- logically needs to be done. Scotty says that there's no chance of escape reaching the necessary velocity because of the weight pretty much everything in the ship is needed so basically that the weight they have to lose equates to three people staying behind boner says you know we're going to draw lots and um spock says no i'm going to make the decision out of logic now that does actually make sense because if you've got to leave people behind you want Hmm. to leave either you want to leave behind those most likely to survive or if you think that there is a real, very real chance of contacting somebody once you've got off the planet, then you need what, the people on the ship that are going to make that the most likely. Yes, to I think make, making a decision on the basis of people's skills is probably more logical uh, than just a random selection where you might end actually end up with the, the worst three on the ship or something. So yeah, no, yeah. I can I can go with that. This, the Spock isn't a knob at this point. No, I don't I don't think so. And I get why the other guy's asking for lots. He's mm. basically saying you know because then it will feel fair. Yeah, perhaps but, he's the most hopeless person who knows full well he ain't going to get chosen. But, <laughs> but it it should be that they've been chosen for this mission because they all have certain skills, and so therefore you're going to split them by skill set Mm -hmm. i think spock's doing the right thing then you have the gold shirt climbing a blatantly polystyrene (laughs) rock in the mist yeah it's it's not great they do their best to disguise it with mist uh, sometimes actual practical mist and sometimes kind of overlaid Mm. uh, which looks odd to be frank but yes they can't cover up the fact that they're clearly in the studio yeah unfortunately with full size proper the shoulder craft's nice though Yes, yes it is, don't get me wrong, but it is very obviously a studio. I mean, it might not have been as obvious in on tellies at the time. Probably not. Uh, but it's really obvious. I also love the way the shuttlecraft door opens with the little ramp coming down. That's yes, you so got, cool. He got very excited about the little ramp coming out. It's excellent. Anyway, one of the people, is it Latimer, suddenly gets speared with an absolutely mm. fuck-off giant massive spear. Yep. It's a bit comic, actually, really, yeah. unfortunately. What they try and do is that so that when they've got the, the, the big, hairy Gary Larson person, because he, he does look like a Gary Larson figure, <laughs> when they've got shots of him, he's holding a smaller spear. And then when you've got shots of the humans, they've got much bigger props to try and make you think that this is indeed a giant. Mm. It just makes me think of lots of what lots of people did on Facebook. I, an actual giant. Yes. <laughs> Quite. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry. But the the other dude, um, who I keep wanting to call Daytona, but that's Ga- not what Gaetano. Yep, yeah, right. Not Daytona. <laughs> Uses his phaser, but ineffectually. Spot comes along and he doesn't express any sort of remorse or feeling because you know he wouldn't. And then examines the spear. Yeah, and, and just pulled it out the body. It's like oh. <laughs> um, and inspects it, and the, the other blokes are criticising him. Now, I get on the one hand that. In terms of him being in command, he ought to, at the very least, offer his condolences or something. Mm, yes. Because even if he doesn't need that, he should know that the men under his command do need that. Yeah, you thought he'd have worked that out, but... Mm. But he is absolutely right to examine the spear because clearly there is a threat to him and the away team. And it's yeah, like... but you don't need to give the whole sort of history lesson of some tribe in on Earth at that as well, which just seems a bit out of place, him talking about it. Surely yeah. he would have compared it to somebody on Vulcan, but... Yeah, it's like that. that's really not the important thing, is it, Spock? Even you should have realised that. Well, I mean, analysing the spear is important because it might give you a yeah, clue. Yeah, but not saying, like, oh, this comes from such and such a tribe. And, you know, it's like, really? Yeah, you could have just said, you know... It's just showing off, really. It's archaeological knowledge, isn't it? Yeah, I suppose. But my issue isn't the way he talks about the spear. My issue is the fact that he doesn't also offer condolences. Mm, yes. And then back on the ship, Kirk talks about feeling, you know, how everything's futile and he's feeling useless because they're running out of time and Cravat the cunt is basically going, oh, you know, you've hardly got any time left at all. There's only 24 hours. It's like, 24 hours a whole fucking day? What are you on? <laughs> oh, yeah, anyway. And and Kirk's all like, yeah, I know. I, and he doesn't actually say, I can fucking count you, twat, but you kind of, <laughs> yeah. that's the vibe, isn't it? Yeah. Is, yeah. yeah. So then they, they decide that they're going to try and deal with the repairs by bypassing a line on the ship. Unfortunately, it goes a bit peak tong and then there's a hissing noise. Now, there's no fuel at all. Oh, no. The door fell out. Oh, dear. 
And so Spock's like, you know, well, now we have to think of an alternative. And Scotty's like, what alternative? There isn't any fuel. We just flushed our fuel away, yeah. But, you know, Spock goes with the whole, there are always alternatives, which, of course, is a line that will come up eventually in the movies. So it's nice. And then you've got Galdate or whatever his name is complaining. (laughs) Gaetano. Uh, right, yeah, anyway, I don't like him, he's a cunt. Mm. And, you know, oh, you should have done this. Oh, I want to hit them, I want to hurt them, or whatever. And he's yeah, like, it's not very Starfleet, is it? It's not very Starfleet. Kill, kill them all! And he's like, you know, you have no regard for life. There must be a way that doesn't involve killing. Oh, no, but we have to, or whatever. And it's just like, you mm, saw man. what they did to whatever. It's just like, oh, fuck off. <laughs> Grow up. You're not two. <sighs> it's shacks. <laughs> yeah. Um, Proto shacks. <laughs> no, because I like Shax. I yeah, want to slap it... this guy with a wet fish. <laughs> and they're all sort of trigger happy. And interesting is Spock then starts to get aggressive. And I wonder whether that's deliberate as a way of he knows enough about cunts like that to know that you control them by being more aggressive than they are. Well, I suppose it could be, but I'm, I, d- I don't really credit him with that sort of knowledge of human uh, emotions, really, at this point, certainly. Um he just seems angry, which is not which really very work. Spock. No, exactly. It doesn't make sense for a Vulcan, yeah. but given that he's half human, well, he would what, have some What Nimoy said was that he struggled to play Spock in this, cause in the sort of command position, because normally he's sparking off Kirk, who's the one with all the emotions. So kind of like he was ha- trying to sort of... It was almost like he felt like he was having to make up for that himself. Okay. So, yeah, it, it, Nimoy wasn't happy with his performance in this, and you can kind of see why, but... yeah. Yeah. Hey, it's early days, early days, and this this the whole point of this episode was to give Spock his own episode because he was proving to be a really popular character. Again, spot how that affects Shatner in this episode. <laughs> but then it's like, no, actually, I've got a better idea. What we're going to do is we we are going to go and you know use our weapons because clearly they're superior to what they've got. But we're doing it to the idea is to frighten them. Yeah, show of force and all that. Um, rather than to kill them. So he's kind of taking their idea and doing something else with it, which you think, you know, that would work. Mm-hmm. Is this, have I got more to say, or do you take Well, no, now? I think I could take over at this okay. point, because, yes, what happens is that then giants, you know, finger quotes giant. around the S, because <laughs> there's clearly only one, drops his shield on them, which suddenly becomes a lot bigger, which <laughs> is just so weird, and knocks a chunk out of the polystyrene. <laughs> Oh, it does. And it's, yeah, it's really bad the way that happens. Uh, Spock hopes they've scared the natives off and poor guy Turner gets left on guard. You kind of think Spock wants him to die at this point. Yeah. Scotty's come up with a cunning plan. Hurrah! Using their phases to power the shuttle. As McCoy points out, that means giving up their only defence, though. And I would have thought they'd just use the power cell from the phaser, but no, they're, they're just, Scotty puts the whole phaser in there, so okay. Lieutenant Galloway has fixed the Enterprise transporters. He was in Miri, by the way, and he'll return several times in the series. Gaetano gets hit by a rock, which looks like he really hurts. It, it does, actually. I really <laughs> like this. I think whoever, whatever they did in terms of... A, I think it actually stung. I mean, obviously, it's only uh, yeah, a proper star yeah, thing, but, but I think, it I think, sting, I it? think it actually it hit. It goes, ow! Yeah, I think it actually hit. I really do. I really do. Either, uh, either that or it's incredibly good acting and timing. Yeah. Except, but it looks properly real. Unfortunately, the good acting then runs out as, I mean, possibly he was told to do this and couldn't find a realistic way of doing it, but he tries to escape by skidding up the polystyrene c- sh- scenery of a sheer rock, which, <sighs> yeah. And then he's monstered by a bloke in a bear suit. Oh, and oh, it's, it's, it's so like sad. It's like some kid playing at being a monster, isn't it? Oh, but it's, it's also, it's more lot zombie than anything else. He's got yeah. his arms out. Brave. I'm a bear. Oh, They're no, called no. furry creatures, but fur, the furries I've met have always been sweet and friendly. So Yes. There's more Boma having a go at Spock, who then illogically goes hunting for the guy Tarino unarmed, which seems a bit stupid, but there we go. But Spock's really strong, though. Yeah, he's not as strong as a big giant, though. Well, we don't know, Go-ray. do we? Uh, he finds the unconscious lieutenant in a paint me like one of your French girls pose on a rock. <laughs> uh, Spook carries him back to the ship whilst giant spears are thrown, knocking chunks out of the polystyrene again. You can see the, the set guy go, no, <laughs> stop it. Expensive, that. McCoy rightly points out how dumb Spock was, thinking the giants would be rational yeah. and leave them alone, having given them a show of strength because they're just angry giants. Mm. Then a single giant attacks the shuttle with a boulder. <laughs> <laughs> Where are all the rest? Well, we know why there's only one that we it's cost. Uh, a little less analysis and a little more action are what we need, McCoy complains. A little less conversation, a little more action, please. All this aggravation ain't satisfaction. 
reflection in me. A little more fine, a little less fun, a little less fine, a little more smart. Close your mouth and open up your heart and maybe say it's my ring. We, you've got your hands full, Scotty very helpfully says, like it's none of his concern. <laughs> it's like, I just do engines, me. This is your problem, Spocky. <laughs> Back on the Enterprise, Ferris is being an arse again. Spock suggests they electrify the shuttle and we have that classic shot of Scotty sparking. <laughs> yeah. I like that. Boma insists on a burial for Guy Turner, which does seem a bit stupid considering they're surrounded, surrounded by a giant. And um, Spock eventually rashly agrees. Another landing party led by Lieutenant Kellowitz, uh, who will be back, has been attacked by the furries. <laughs> well, and uh, Ferris points out that Kirk's time is up and now he has authority. You will respect my authority! Kirk recalls the search parties and the Columbus, which is the other shuttle, and then orders they set off at space normal speed. Yes, they haven't invented impulse yet. During the burial, Spock gets trapped under a boulder and orders Bomar and McCoy to back to lift up but they rescue him. The furries are apparently holding onto the shuttle. <laughs> I can't imagine that. They didn't try and show it. I mean, they couldn't because they only had one guy, but, you know. And they have to boost free, leaving them only enough for one orbit and then crash landing. Scotty chides Spock. Mr. Spock, you said a while ago that there were always alternatives. Did I? I may have been mistaken. Well, at least I've lived long enough to hear that. <laughs> Which is lovely. <laughs> sure enough, Spock jettisons the fuel and ignites it to signal the Enterprise, which sharp-eyed Sulu spots. Yay, Sulu saves the day. Yay! The remaining Galileo crew re- congratulate Spock on his illogical move and the Enterprise beams them to safety. And we finish with Kirk chiding Spock about his illogical move. But the Vulcan justifies it on the basis that illogical actions were the only logical option. Mm. And then we get some very, very naff laugh, laughing oh. actor from Shatner. That's just appalling. He really didn't want to be in the show, did he? Never mind. Early Spock, I find a bit irritating. I must admit, sometimes you know he's too Vulcan, and as it turns out, Vulcans are nearly always dislikable. It's not. It wasn't as bad as I remembered it being. Having said that, but oh boy, though the giant is crap. The giant is really shit. <laughs> and in terms of Spock and Command stuff, like I said, I don't have a problem with a lot of what he does what I have a problem with is, is what he doesn't do if you see what I mean so he's fine doing what he does it's just that in addition he needs to do certain things so like if for example they genuinely can't have they can't bury him they can't they haven't got time for that which is often the case in war mm. he should remind them of that but then say we will of course have a memorial service yes. on the Enterprise. Do you see what I mean? That's, Jeez, the, that's the way to do it. That, that's the sort of thing that he isn't doing. So I yeah. don't have a problem with what he does do. I have an issue with what, what's but lacking. He's, he's got to be unlikable in this for the story to work and it's yeah, it's not mm. right. Hey ho. No. So yeah, it's a bit meh for my liking. All the shuttlecraft model shots are excellent. I mostly enjoyed this. I, the fact that Spock misses certain things... I kind of put it down to a lack of training, really. If he attended Starfleet, he should have been yeah. told those things. Yeah. So that annoys me, but I just think the scenery and the giant is silly. <laughs> Indeed. What do other people think? Boss writes, First thing to mention, Scotty and Sulu are back, and Scotty at least got quite a, do- quite a bit to do. He did. The concept of a small group of people being stranded and requiring rescue has been done so many times, it's hard not to see this as an old idea, even though at the time it wasn't. Well, actually, no, that's just it. They were recycling that from that movie, yeah. so it, it was an old idea. In this instance, though, the focus isn't just on the rescue, but also on Spock struggling with his logical approach in his first command. I did like the way he started to doubt himself towards the end, but for a lot of the episode, he did come across as a bit of a knob. Yeah. Kirk didn't have much to do except argue with the commissioner, who was a very grumpy man. <laughs> I suspect his grumpiness was partly due to someone having cut off the bottom half of his cape. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> caught it in the door. <laughs> <laughs> The augmented effects used on the Netflix version do give very lovely looking green anomaly, but meant that the shuttle on the ground looked nothing like the shuttle seen from space. Mm. The interior of the shuttle was very minimal and I assume looked rubbish in both versions. Yeah, they don't alter the interior of the shuttle. So again, you know, we've got the outside looking very high tech and then the inside looking... Like a bus, really. really. Yeah, I mean, it's not too bad. It doesn't have bus seats. Yes. <laughs> it's okay. And I like the fact that they've got a ceiling on it and it's... 
you know, it's a, it's a full set, so that's yeah. quite cool. I like the fact the uh, impulse, the yeah, the impulse engines or warp engines, the nasals, uh, anyway, match those of the Enterprise, so it sort of it fits. It's mm-hmm. cool. The scenes on the planet where they're being stalked by the alien residents were okay when you could hear but not see them. <laughs> After that, the rubber spears and obviously fake rocks did let it down a bit. A bit. They could at least have made the point of the spears a bit heavier so they fell the correct way. <laughs> I thought the laughing ending was inappropriate considering two of the seven hadn't made it back. Yeah, I know that. And that's another thing when Hura uh, reports... Oh, by the way, Hura gets a decent amount to say in yeah. this surprise, and, and she does some nice sort of facial background acting as well. Yeah. So, yeah, it's cool. But, yeah, she, says, she reports that five of them uh, are on board the shuttle and, and Kirk's like, oh, good, and you're thinking... You couldn't be like, oh, no, which two are dead? I mean, maybe Spock's one of the dead ones, you numpty. I'm getting confused by the shirt colours. While it was still security guards getting killed this time, they were in yellow and Scotty was in red. No, they weren't security. They were a navigating pilot person, so he was going to be in gold, because they are uh, generally. And who's the other one who's in yellow? The security... Yes, no, um, Gaetano would have made more sense in red. You're okay. right, actually, because he did, he did see more security. But perhaps he was on the, you know, on the command wrong and he was working his way up, so you don't I know. I don't know, I get confused. But, yeah, we, he's not going to be much missed. <laughs> I wonder why they didn't rip out the two surplus seats when I trying to save weight well. before taking off. Yes. Good point. Hmm. Over the, overall, the episode did keep my attention throughout, so it wasn't too bad. Yeah, it kept mine as well, to yeah, be fair. Yeah. yeah. It wasn't boring. No, it wasn't crap. It's just it did have its shortcomings. Yes. We've heard from Doreen. The Galileo 7 um, Star Trek episode was good. I enjoyed the inclusion of Bones. It was very good. I very much enjoyed watching him. Uh, I wasn't so chuffed with the stereotyping of the black character. But it was the 60s, so we can't really um, judge them on today's standards. Or perhaps shouldn't, as more likely. I enjoyed the poetic ideas and poetic ways of speaking at the beginning. I also noticed that they nearly left out the female character, and they did so at the beginning, but um, included included her more after that. Spock and their sort of um, teasing of Spock was quite good and how they they finished the episode with the the teasing and I suppose it showed you them coming together as a crew, as a team so I did enjoy it thanks very much, bye bye bye, thank you thank you yes, McCoy is good in this Uh, he's got got some lovely lines I I wasn't too sure about Boma, did you find him stereotypical for a black character? I mean, he, um, he wasn't the all aggressive one. Was no, he? that was Daytona. Yeah, uh, um, yes. But whereas Boma was more sort of kind of in the middle a, a bit, you know, he was kind of comforting Gaetano, and but he did have criticisms to make of Spot. But I didn't. Yeah, I, I didn't, didn't find him stereotypical. Hmm. But you know, maybe I'm missing something. But the yeoman definitely didn't get too much to do. No. Uh, but then I guess probably the coffee machine was broken, so. You know, her role was pretty much minimal in this. Yeah. <laughs> Mostly it involved her sort of leaning over so you could see down her dress, but there you go. It was the 60s. And it was um, Rodenberry. <laughs> yes. What did the llama god make of this? I'm going to like Scotty, Fixion, Yayig, Och. Stormy weather's turned to blue. Here's a song to take with you. What this episode does really well is it answers the question, which they definitely would have been thinking of at the time, should you ever recast Spock? And on the basis of the performance that Leonard Nimoy gives in this episode, the answer to that is categorically, emphatically, no. Now, that's not to say that Zachary Quinto and Ethan Peck don't do good work with what they're given, and Ethan Peck should be applauded for doing his own take on the Spock character, because there's no way you can follow up Leonard Nimoy's performance in this episode, or indeed at all as Spock, because he is just so definitively, iconically this character, and it is, for a large part, his performance that makes this episode 
work and work so very very well because the crux of the story how many do you sacrifice for the greater good is a classic one but it's spun out and played really really well with Spock there in his first command post having to make the decision of who they sacrifice so that the majority can get home safe and that's exactly the sort of decision that someone in a position of command has to face regularly so it's good to see Spock being put through this as well it's his own Kowareshi Maru in a way really even though we learn later that he never faced the Kowareshi Maru which hadn't been invented at this point but anyway and seeing him work through the problem of their being stuck on the planet and having to get off the planet and the dwindling resources and dealing with it in a very emotionless and logical way but at the same time you can tell how conflicted and confused he is at times especially when confronted with the very illogical cavemen who don't react logically to his plans it's just really good scene it's a really really good character study of Spock the weakness of the whole thing is potentially why you would have the chief medical officer and the chief engineer on this shuttlecraft which apparently doesn't fly with windows but just instruments and the helmsman has to reach behind him to steer the ship or something that was just weird but I'll over that because that, that's a limitation of 1960s sets so yeah you could argue that they shouldn't have been on the shuttle but in the Kirk era trek then we know that the Starfleet was a bit more fast and loose with the rules so yeah I'm gonna forgive them that one but basically this episode is really about Spock and it's, it's just great and that's not to say that the other actors don't give good performances DeForest Kelly is great as is James Doohan very understated just giving performances about bounce off and always very straight to take on the character so yeah it's all great and a really really good character piece topped off really by Spock's emotional outburst or the closest thing he's come to an emotional outburst at this point at the end yeah it's really good stuff of course the problem with this episode is everything that we've seen since before um, yeah and that's the problem with making prequels like Discovery this is why you don't do prequels because you know we have seen an emotionally compromised Spock before and yeah in terms of television productions for the first time but we have seen a Spock actually have a character before so having watched Discovery now and then coming to you know this is basically later older Spock seeing him behave as slightly like emotional outburst yeah it's not it's not entirely out of character really is it so yeah it's a bit of a shame they destroy the mythos there ever so slightly and unintentionally they may, some of the facts in this episode contradict what we've seen before as well although you can forgive them that one Spock not wanting to attack the cavemen with force is definitely in contradiction to the Vulcan halo that we learn about in the first episode of Discovery although that said the Vulcan halo came from the Vulcan's own knowledge of the Klingons so at this point Spock knew nothing about the cavemen so you can kind of understand why he wouldn't have gone for fruit force straight away and it's just amusing that Spock says he doesn't believe in angels but of course bear in mind that at this point he's been sworn to secrecy about everything so he can't tell so yeah so I guess he has to say that doesn't he so yeah yeah nice little touch there kind of backwards forwards thing timey wimey anyway there is also the B plot on the Enterprise itself which seems to kind of exist just to give Shatner something to do but it does add to the peril that they face on the planet knowing that rescue has a good reason for not leaving because there's a plague a plague in Paris yeah great that's just what we wanted to hear thanks keep it topical why don't you as Ferris who is a will arsehole yeah that's the best I could come up with so I've been thinking about this for days as Ferris who is just along for the ride keeps insisting that Kirk leave orbit and yeah if the choice was to leave someone behind so the Enterprise could break a bit there's definitely no doubt on who we think would have been used to lighten their load there and whilst the Enterprise plot can feel kind of throwaway it does add to the jeopardy so not a problem with that really the downside to this episode is of course that the cavemen are indeed rubbish it's just a tall guy in a really bad coat actually the first time that we see them where they're kind of out of focus and off screen and obscured slightly through the smoke yeah that kind of works kind of works and makes them mysterious but as soon as we see them trying to attack the shuttle yeah there's just tall guys in coats that doesn't work at all now of course slightly more forgivable than the CG effects are in the remastered versions that are on Netflix the shuttle taking off from the Enterprise in particular is really bad and shoddy CGI and yeah, I kind of would rather have seen the original model work but oh well never mind and the real downside really and a total HR nightmare is the scene on the end of the bridge which is a comedy scene where Kirk and the bridge crew basically try to bully Spock into admitting he acted emotionally yes yes we end with a nice bit of good natured bullying so yeah that was nice to see wasn't it yeah a bit uncomfortable really that aside this was a really great episode and the kind of story that 60s Trek does really well some tight character focused drama putting a good spin on either what wasn't a trope then or maybe was but yeah putting their own spin on it and, and coming up with something fresh and yeah this is really good stuff really enjoyed this one so as ever I'm looking forward to finding out what everyone else made of these I hope that everyone is looking forward to a good Christmas and that any parties that you may or may not be having adhere to any rules that we may or may not have and until next time a glorious Christmas to you and your cast and to all a good night Ta sir thank you oh, by the way it was quoting from Mike Oldfield's track Taurus the beginning there oh it was interesting what he was saying about Ethan Peck uh, not quite matching Leonard Nimoy's Spock because Ethan Peck's Spock features in uh, our December uh, Discovery calendar. And uh, Mother-in-law took one look and went, who's that supposed to be? And I said, it's Spock. And she went, no. <laughs> uh, that's a good point. Why Why does the shuttlecraft not have any windows? It kind of does. And if you look at the closing credits, you'll see that there's kind of an outtake shot of it in the shuttle bay with one of the windows open. 
Oh. And so there's three windows at the front, but they remain closed, basically because it's cheaper on effects. You know, they'd have to put a staff. But surely if they're, suddenly they're about to crash, it would make sense to, like... Well, they're running on uh, instruments, aren't they, is the idea. Yeah, but the instruments don't fucking work, so open the fucking windows? Well, arguably, I suppose, but then perhaps that's a danger and the windows might break, so, you know, mm. better to keep the, uh, the blast shields up. Oh, OK. Close the blast doors! And, uh, it, yes, Ferris is a wheel arsehole. Yes, a wheel one. Yes, yes. very good, very yes. good. Yes, and the whole sort of I don't believe in angels... I believe in angels... ...thing. Yeah, yeah, let's, let's, not, let's not dwell on yeah. how difficult it is to do stuff that's supposed to be based before stuff that was in the 1960s, because, yeah. Anyway... Uh, next up, we hear from Drew and Tracy. And uh, what's the uh, betting on this being a classic as far as Drew's concerned? Yep, I yep. reckon. Yep. Hello, sir. Feedback for the Galileo 7. And what do you think of that one then? I don't know if I said this yet, but this is one of my very favourite TOS episodes. I'm really glad you said that because I was like, I'm going to say I really enjoyed this. And I'm like, oh, I'm just going to get like munted off because everyone's going to go, oh, this is I know Peter was saying he didn't like this episode on the last episode. I, I love it. I hey, uh, really, really do like this you're episode. Wrong. I really enjoyed it. This was yeah. really like kind of tension filled. Mm. Um, I, I, I will say there's a lot of bad stuff in this episode. Okay, go on then. Well, the behaviour of a lot of people. I mean, no one comes out of this great. I mean, but there's a lot of, like the humans, a lot of them are far too emotionally driven. Boma and McCoy. In fact, the only one that isn't really is Scotty. And Spock doesn't do everything correct, you know. He, he has that that bit right in the middle where he's basically having a, like a panic attack. All right, so let's just go back. So you've got like seven crew who have crash landed on a planet. Yep. And they've been told there's no chance of getting out, so they want to do everything they can to survive. Right. The only yep. person who really doesn't get, like when the when Spock is saying or Scotty's saying, well, we need to lose like five hundred pounds, and Scotty's like. Um, sorry, uh, Spock is like, oh yeah, we, we that's two crew members. And they're like, oh yeah, we can leave two crew behind. And they're all going, what the fuck are you talking about? Who can you expend? The only person that can make that decision is Spark. Would yeah, be yeah. A I'm not saying that. So something. why would you say like the humans on yeah. ga- the Galileo would not be freaking the fuck out? Because you're like, if I don't give like Spock a blowjob now, he's not going to like save me. They, they, I mean, especially Barman. Just too emotionally driven. That they would not. But lie. it's, it's, it's fight know, or flight, isn't it? it when when like Bomer at the end, he's saying he wants to like do the burial and like all the creatures around the, the ship and that lot. And he's going, oh, wait, I'm not leaving until no, he gets a burial. They weren't there at that point. Like, I, I Spock would, was I'd saying, I'd be cutting up the body and like pushing it through a crack in the window. <laughs> Really, who wants to go out there and get a burial? Well, sorry, that is no. Commissioner Ferris as well. What a smug looking. What a fucking. Oh, he is. Cunt. I'm sorry. <laughs> I, I don't like to use that word, but Jesus Christ! Every, every time he keeps coming, you've got two hours forty three seconds. Yeah. That you'd just be like, get off my. That's bridge. what I said to you. Like when he kept coming and going, Kirk. You've got 24 hours. I'd just be like, in the fucking uh, airlock, get the fuck out right now, you dick. So I did say at the beginning, there's three main crew of the bridge on the away mission. Why the fuck are they on there? But then it kind of developed and I was like, oh, I know, I know why Scott is there. And McCoy was like the foil to Spark. Yeah. And Kirk was really concerned. And I really loved this because I really felt Kirk's endearing kind of concern yeah, for yeah, the crew yeah. and just before they went to like the uh the credits you know when they said oh the crew's been lost it was just like oh and it was just really endearing i liked it i guess because he wasn't doing any shacting overacting yes, he exactly. had to be you know more low-key I exactly guess. and i did kind of wonder why they couldn't use their communicators it is the ionization wasn't it everything well, you did was, say that everything but, you was, know. Uh, not working correctly so the furry bears yeah, the, the creatures. Were throwing, like, the big spears. Yes. And, like, they were bouncing off, like, well, they bounced oh, off, I like, know. that there dead some, guy's there head, There were some terrible they? effects. Why could they not have just, like, collected them and then, like, 
there's no way they could have they could have done because they couldn't have fought them things but you know the sheer body weight of them no they wouldn't have had any go yeah but they lost their phases because they had to use those Mm. for power if you have a fucking great big spear maybe that is a threat the only thing I was going to say at the end and it was so fun when like they were all back on the bridge and whatever Mm -hmm. and like Kirk was taking the piss out of like spark blah 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 yeah but he didn't say, actually, seven men went down. And yeah, five I know. Back. Yes, yep. Yeah, it's quickly glossed over. I know, we, I think we're now going to start moving into the every uh, episode's got to be like taking the mick out of Spock, which I don't think is a good thing. They start just basically yeah. becoming bullies, and this is the start of it. And I guess these are the beginnings of the red shirts. Well, there's no red shirts killed in this episode. Well, no, but they were yellow shirts. They were both yellow shirts. Yep. And that's the running joke. Anyway, I liked it. I really enjoyed it. I really, really like this episode. It's one of my very faves. Cool. And it's not perfect. Got stuff wrong, but it's a good episode. Leave it there then. Okie dokie. Take it easy, guys. See you later. Bye. 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 Yeah, as I said, I liked it better than I remembered actually you know, liking it in the past. But as Drew says, the characters aren't likeable. That's a big problem. Yeah. yeah. Including Spock. <laughs> Although Tracy's way of getting Spock on side certainly is... Um, it, yeah. Yeah, okay. <laughs> if I don't give Spock a blowjob, he won't take me. Mm. <laughs> um, okay, right. Yeah, as I said, I I don't think... Spock isn't well written in this because Starfleet should have trained him better in, in command. I don't find him too much of a knob, if you see what I mean. He's, he's lacking, but... The whole thing, like at the end, you're like, oh, ha, 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 we're all going to laugh about it because it's all fine, two of them didn't come back. Just made me think about the way the news in this country reports things. It's like, you know, th- it's like, you know, seven people died, but none of them were British, so we don't care. It's like, mm. clearly, the two people who died weren't British, so it was fine. Yeah, apparently. Mm. What did Parry make of this? Hello, Args. Parry here to talk about the Galileo 7. Galileo! 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 Galileo, Galileo Figaro! enough of that bill uh anyway this is again it's considered one of the good episodes and i can kind of see why um for starters we get a new spaceship i mean again it's not new to us we've seen these episodes before but i like the i think is that the type f shuttle um can't remember but it's it's just a neat boxy kind of thing it's it's like a bus uh you know like a space bus and it's got all the seats or you know maybe like a a kind of people carrier but uh yeah, it's quite a neat interior set, um, and the exterior is quite good. One of the neat things I do like they did in the remaster is uh, they actually make the little landing pad in the back retract, which I think is quite cool. Um, but yes, the main plot is uh, they're looking at a green swirly thing, a shuttle crashes, and uh, Spock's got to try and get the shuttle flying again before the Enterprise goes. Now, while I mean, you know, on the ship you have Kirk with the kind of annoying um, administrator bloke in his weird skippy cape um, the guy is an arse like he's spending all his time smirking and ah you've got 24 hours before you have to abandon people the really annoying thing is he's kind of got a point right at the beginning and you know, they're, they're delivering it's not like I think if they wanted to make Varys a more unsympathetic character I mean they were really trying you know, he is who we're meant to dislike but the problem is that Kirk's there to deliver some life-saving vaccines to to be transferred on to another colony. And he's then decided to stop and look at the green thing. Now, I would have said just something like, you know, that administrator has to go and take up his new post there and make it something like he's late for dinner or late for an official function rather than um, vaccines. Because vaccines does make Kirk look a bit careless and... Kirk's basically saying, yes, there's 10,000 people on a planet who could be dying of some sort of plague, but I'm going to hang around a lot to look for these seven people. You know, it's it, it's annoying because he is such an arse about it, the Varus guy. Varus, Varus, can't remember, but either way he's an arse about it. So that's kind of a think thing they could have done better. On the planet, we have Spock in charge of a group, and it is showing that... I, I did actually like Spock pointing out that, you know, when McCoy kind of says, oh, your opportunity to prove that logic is the best way of command, and Spock actually says, I've not had a desire for command. Uh, you know, he's never really sought it. Um, and in that, we kind of get the conflict of Spock running into himself. I mean, a great powerhouse by uh, Nimoy. And you do have, um, again, he's kind of struggling to keep a bit of discipline amongst his, well, yellow shirts, I suppose, in this case, since 
new the ones who die are red shirts and uh, it's uh, the other guy Boma I think it was um, who is you know sort of constantly grating against the fact that Spock's in charge and uh, is too emotionless um, I thought it was quite good when actually he kicked off that uh, Scotty and McCoy both kicked off and said no hold on a second and again there's things like you know they say oh we might have to leave three people behind um, and Spock says well I'll choose who it is at the end and he's going oh haven't you heard of calling lots and it's, Spock has a point uh, they might need Scotty on the way up if he drew the short straw um, they'll probably need a medic um, but one of the things he probably doesn't realise is that Spock's the sort of person who would probably say well once you're all in space you don't need me anymore and would have left himself behind he is that kind of self-sacrificing person where the kind of planet stuff falls down is actually that uh, the kind of opponents they've got um, the kind of vaguely big blokes and manky carpets hurling oversized spears and essentially you see a lot of they, I mean they do keep them off screen as much as possible and that's kind of a mercy because they are a rubbish baddie and basically seeing these big plaster spears kind of flying around the set every so often it just isn't convincing as a threat and I think uh, I think it would have been better if they'd made it something like a toxic atmosphere, something that they couldn't survive, but maybe you don't actually have to deal with uh, an alien because they clearly didn't have the budget for it. And bless them for trying to have giants kicking about, but it didn't really work out. So uh, all that remains for me to say is do keep up the good work. Um, I always look forward to the podcast, and I'll hopefully feed back in the next episode. But until then, bye for now. Bye. Bye. You guessed our play out song. <laughs> yes, fairly predictable. Yeah. Um, it has to be said, you do wonder what the writer was thinking when he wrote, I know we'll have giants. You, yeah. 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 How are you going to achieve that without having, you know, our regulars far away and <laughs> the so baddies near? Far away. <laughs> yes. Yeah. And it's not just that it's a ru- rubbish baddies. But it's a rubbish baddie. It's a singular baddie. Yes, that's part of the problem. I mean, if there'd been a few more of them, maybe, maybe. it would have been better. Although, to be honest, it was a, it was a crap look anyway. It was, sense. wasn't it? Yes. And uh, I think you're right. I think Spot would have left himself behind. I think that too. And and he might have said that at that point, and that would have been some reassurance to people. I think actually. Again, it's not what he does say. I have a problem. With it. It's what he doesn't say. Mm. So he doesn't say that. He yeah. doesn't offer condolences. That's the yeah. that's that's the issue. And yeah. I don't think Kirk is completely careless in that he's not delivering vaccines directly to the planet, although I, we, we're not told why. Instead, he's got a rendezvous where with whoever it is who is going to deliver them to the planet. So he's still holding them up, isn't he? So, so yeah. but if he arrives early, it doesn't help anyone because where he's transferring them to isn't going to be there. Ah, I see what you mean. Okay. Mm. So him spending every last possible moment isn't a problem. Him risking being late is. Yeah. But it's still... I don't know whether they did medical supplies and vaccines or whatever to make cunt face look more sympathetic, but they Mm. gave him a cravat, so what was the point? (laughs) Hey, they were in at the time. This is our second cravat in as many episodes, actually, isn't it? So, yeah. (laughs) Will there be any cravats in the next episode? Well, <laughs> the next episode actually is our Christmas special in two weeks' time, so uh, which is sort of vaguely connected to Picard. That that's how long ago we'd planned it, yeah, pre-COVID. But uh, as per usual, we we've got good friends and Andy and Amber to join us for a commentary uh, for a film that tied in with Picard back when Picard was still quite a live thing. But there we are. Uh, we eventually got to record it earlier this year, and uh, that'll be coming your way on this feed for Christmas. And then on the 6th of January, we shall be covering Court Martial. First of two Ooh, trial stories. I seem to remember I like that one. It has a character that you like very much in it. Aha. Yes. Cool. <laughs> Excellent. So something to look forward to for the new year. OK, folks, have a fantastic Christmas. Happy Christmas. And a wonderful new year. And we'll catch you in January. Take care. Bye. 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 Too late. My time has come, sends shivers down my spine, body's aching all the time. Goodbye, everybody. The opening music for this podcast was provided by the talented Drew Barker. The artwork was created by Andy Palastides. All music referenced is for illustrative purposes only, and no copyright infringement is intended. Find our website at broadcast.libsyn.com. 
And we have a YouTube channel as well. You can find the broadcast playouts on Spotify for your listening pleasure. Visit our Tumblr site at broadcast.tumblr.com where you'll find images accompanying the episodes discussed in this cast. Send emails or mp3s to broadcast at gmail.com Or you can contact us via Twitter on rev underscore org or broadcast ammo. Hashtag Borkas. I see a little silhouette of a man. Scaramouche, get a moose, will you do the fandango? Thunderbolt and lightning, very, very frightening me. Galileo, 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 Figaro. I'm just a poor boy, nobody loves me. Shut it down! Damn it, Bill. You're an actor, not a singer.